Yeah. Big shark. <laughs> no. None of that. announcement, quite a few announcements, matter of fact. Uh, Judy Dunbar's celebration of life is Saturday the 12th, if you haven't already been notified, here at the church at 11 a.m., and um, there will be a time of, uh, of fellowship afterwards, and, uh, and it's not a potluck. You may have gotten some word that's a potluck. Uh, the, the majority of the meal will be provided, so what we're going to ask you to do is contact the office uh, and just see what kind of desserts. All we're going to have to do is just provide desserts as a congregation, but find out first because we may have more desserts than we'll ever eat. Well, I don't know. If, is that even possible? Can you even have more desserts than you ever eat? Can you eat? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, but then, it, then also, and so there's going to be a vision potluck the following. So next Sunday, uh, we're going to break in the marriage series and we're going to have a vision potluck. Uh, we've got some exciting news to share with you next Sunday. And so this place will be transformed. There'll be tables and chairs like we do every year. And uh, we'll have the meal here. And so with that, uh, I encourage you to look at your outline or bulletin, rather. There's some inserts. So basically, for those whose last name's A to H, we encourage you to bring desserts. For I to Z, bring in salad or a side dish. And of course, if you have any questions, contact Jill uh, at uh, uh, Information Central. Also, here at Family Life Christian Church, a lot of people wonder, who are you, what you're about, where are you going? Uh, we want to know if we can be part of that or how can we be part of that? What do you believe? We offer every probably every six weeks or so a class called Family Life 101. It's a, it's a membership class. It helps people expedite the process because sometimes you can go to a church for years and years and years and, and realize, like, I, I don't believe that or I don't want to go in that direction. We don't want to do that. We want to be able to give you an opportunity. So I teach that. That's on February 20th from 3 to 7.30. And there will be child care provided. And so I encourage you to uh, sign up for that if you haven't done so already. Also, the Better Man's class, I've been talking about that. We're going to be starting on the 23rd at 6 a.m. on Wednesday. And, uh, and for some of you men that have never been part of that, I'm just going to challenge you to, uh, to commit to that for that, that 12-week period, 11 to 12-week period. And uh, because here's the deal. You will not find this information out in the world. I'm sorry. You're not going to find it. Uh, there is no place in this world uh, unless they're teaching out of the scriptures what it means to be a godly man. And if you're wondering what it's like to be a godly man, uh, definitely come to this class. I want just to share just a blurb of what you're going to learn the first session. It says here, as men, we often make the mistake of processing out of our own lives alone. We kind of just like, what's it mean to be a man for me? And, and here's, here's what we come up with. is like, I should know what to do. Why don't I know what to do? I don't know how to handle this situation in my marriage, in my parenting, in my job, in my own personal thought life. Also, am, am I the only one that struggles with this? That, isn't that for all of us, though? We get caught into that lie that I'm the only one that's messing up in my home. It's not true. We all mess up. We'll talk more about that today. And also this one. Here's a big one. It's too late 
to do anything about this. No, it's not. As long as you're breathing in and out, it's never too late. And the best time to start is now. And so we encourage you to think about that. I can do this and no one else will ever know. Oh, that's not true. Or if I tell the truth about myself, you will reject me. That's a big fear for all of us. If I take this facade, this mask that I'm wearing, and I take it off and you see the true me, and you reject me, well, it's tough luck for me because that's all I have. Well, you need to be in a place where it says, hey, you're not alone. We all wear masks at some level. And when we can take that mask down and feel safe, freedom begins. Because I tell you what, if you can understand that everybody's in the same boat, that's huge. So here's the question. Can we define manhood that will work for us in this uh, modern world? Here's five promises that we're going to walk through. First of all, you will increase your manhood understanding and make some significant personal discoveries. You will receive helpful insight and support from your table leaders. Uh, You will make some new friends. And also, you will have the opportunity to upgrade your manhood by using weekly Better Man questions that are going to challenge you. And the fifth one is you will receive a clear definition of manhood that will work for you in this modern world. And so that's going to be something that we're going to go through because um, <clears throat> we already know this, that when Satan turns the head of the man, the family is affected in a very negative way. But when God turns the head of a man, the family is affected in a very positive way. And I will tell you, all you have to do is ask those wives and mothers and and ask them um, and children whether or not that's a true statement, and you'll find that's being true. Our first year of doing this, uh, we had 35 wives come up and say thank you. 35, I've never had that before, you know, but there'll be uh, some more things on that. So that's on the 23rd at 6 a.m. Please sign up, and, and you can see Jill at the Informational Central. Also, needs list, help setting up to tear down for vision potluck. Uh, if you want to help with that, that's a way... Uh, um, that would be a, a blessing. Also, if you're a first-time guest, be sure to stop by the Information Central and pick up your gift and get any of your questions answered about the church. Uh, so that's just right out here. You can see it in the corner here. And also, our giving back to God um, opportunities or our remembering Jesus. If you're new with us, if you're not new with us, you know what we're talking about. Uh, we don't pass the plates anymore. We don't pass the communion and bread anymore. Uh, we want to uh, encourage you just to get your heart right. The bottom line is with communion, the bread and the juice, if your heart's not in a thankful, grateful attitude uh, that has uh, sought reconciliation, it does you no good. So we give you an opportunity. We've actually extended our time of remembering Jesus, your communion with Christ. Uh, And when you feel ready, you can go back there and take it. Um, Also, too, I mean, it's like right now we're going to be talking about marriage. Some of you, I'm guessing, maybe uh, are are maybe kind of at odds right now in your relationship with your spouse. Well, what God would want you to do is to make it the attempt to reconcile with your spouse during that time and then go back together and take it. But if your heart is not reconciled during this service, then don't take it until you are reconciled. Same with anybody else for that matter. Giving the same way. God is not interested in getting your resources. God owns everything, right? He wants your heart. That's what he wants. It's because, see, out of the heart, everything takes place. And so if our heart is given to the things of this world, which are so uncertain, we're always let down. So God says, put me first in your life and see what happens. And so if you feel uh, uh, the need to put God first in your life, his box is back for that. Um, One other thing is is that uh, we do have these um, uh, church uh, Bibles that are on the tables back there. We've had them for, for quite some time. Um, if you do not have a Bible, please take one. You take one, but only on one condition is you promise to read it. All right, this is not a cup holder. This is not just an icon you put on the shelf, you know. Uh, it, it, can I share one thing and then we'll get going? Uh, will you, when we meet with people, it is absolutely amazing. And like as shepherd leaders, we're going to continue to do our best to meet with people. But uh, when we were going through that meeting with four families a week, uh, it was kind of funny that when we'd meet with them, they're thinking, the pastor's coming, the elders are coming, what cups? You know, you throw all the cups and we get the old Christian, Christian cup out, right? And then the Bible comes out, it's on the table. It's like, yeah, that Bible, here, pff, dust flies come out of the thing. And, uh, but you know what, live in grace, don't worry about it. If we come to showing up at your house, it's not because we're, you know, uh, going to critique all of that. We just want to see how you're doing and love on you. 
Um, but, uh, but if you have one of those, and of course, if you want to use that today, uh, I'll be giving you some references on where to find it in the scripture for that as well. But right now, I want to have a time of prayer uh, in our, um, uh, um, uh, our part of the service where we, we uh, pull these out and we fill these out if you have any questions about the church, any commitments you want to make. But the biggest thing here is to talk to God uh, on behalf of yourself and others. And, um, and I'm telling you, God, um, He listens. He does listen. And so I want to just take a few moments. If you have a, a, a victory prayer request that has been answered, uh, we, we want to give you, give you an opportunity to share that. Has God answered any of your prayers this week? Do you like to share? Yes. All right. Yes. And, and you guys think, well, yeah, I travel all the time. Well, nothing's guaranteed, is it? And so praise God. Anybody else would like to share a, a victory of what God has answered your prayer? Anybody? Yes. Amen. When you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things begin to you as well. Put God first at your day. And, you know, and I also thank God for his promises. You, we, because, you know, why we do what we do is we tell the world about the good news of Jesus Christ, that he came to save them. No matter what we go through in life, that we can hold on to his promises. And his promises are true. And for those of you who are hurting today, uh, just be reminded that God's with you. Uh, he's uh, Jehovah Shammah, the Lord who is there. He's with you. And, um, and, uh, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. And so we're going to take a few seconds to pause in prayer, fill those cards out, turn those in. And, um, but let's pray for strength and endurance, okay? Because well, Satan wants us to trip us up, and, and he, when life happens, he, um, he wants us to, to, to get angry at God and to walk away from God. But my question is to all of us, including myself, is if we walk away from God, where shall we go? Where would, there be, where would we go to find peace, joy, love? Peace? Nowhere. And so let's just hang in there, okay? Just 30 seconds, and then I'll pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for being here. It's by faith that we believe that you're here. Because you have promised in your word that you will never leave us nor forsake us. For those who are hurting today, you are here. You're here to comfort them, to walk with them, to carry them, to let them know that, uh, that you love them. So we do have a special prayer for Alan and his family and Kevin and their family this week. We know that your promises are true, that uh, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord, which is better by far, but it's still hard for all of us that are experiencing this loss, Father. And we just lift, up, lift, it, lift it up to you. Father, may we honor you with our lives. Father, just go before us to be beacons into this world of darkness. You tell us to let our light shine before men that they may see our good deeds and praise you are in heaven. Father, we want to be part of that. We want the world to know that there is a difference in our response when life happens. That our hope is not found in the things of this world, it is found in Jesus Christ. So Father, again, I just thank you for this time. May our hearts be ready to hear what you want us to hear. Help us to see what you want us to see and hear what you want us to hear. Father, we ask in the power of Christ's name to bind the enemy from, from this service today, Father. May we walk out here as warriors for your cause. And Father, may we never give up, never give in, Father, until the day that you come for us. Until then, Father, may we glorify you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Good morning. So as we continue in our worship time and prepare for communion, I want to take a few minutes to, to remember Jesus. And this morning what I'd like to do is kind of unpack the gift that Jesus brought for each one of us. 
So I think we, we're all aware that Jesus came into this world in flesh and lived a perfect life and then laid that life down to pay for the, the sins of all of us. In Matthew 26, 28, Jesus, referring to the commun- ju- juice of communion, says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. In Romans 3, 23 through 24, we read, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption that is, which is in Jesus Christ. And in Galatians 1, 3 through 4, we read, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. From these verses and so many others, we know Jesus came and laid his life down to pay the price for our sin. He came and rescued us from ourselves. But in doing this, he accomplished oh so much more. He was reconciling us with our God. From Matthew 27, I mentioned this last week, um, we read that when Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. And in Galatians 4, 4 through 5, we read, when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, and that we might receive adoption as sons. So Jesus reconciled us. That veil was torn because we didn't need anything separating us from God anymore. By the blood of Christ, we're made holy and we can approach our Father. Now we can have a personal relationship with God, so much so that, guys, we've been adopted as his children. That's a big thing, don't you think? But it doesn't stop there. We can continue to unpack this gift. In John 14, 16 through 18, we hear Jesus saying, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. God sent his Holy Spirit to live in each believer that he would be with us always, and he always is with us. So what an incredible gift Christ has given us, forgiveness, reconciliation, and the Holy Spirit. He did all this that we may have life, and life abundant, filled with peace and victory. In Philippians 4, 6 through 7, we read, Be anxious for nothing, and everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. And in Luke 10, 19, we read, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Wow, we can walk in the peace of God and the victory of Christ. Quite the gift, isn't it? So he brought us absolute transformation of heart and mind to each one of us, bringing us to a true life, a life of peace and power in Jesus Christ. He exchanged our life of darkness, hopelessness, in eternal condemnation for a life of light, hope, peace, and eternal life with him. As we prepare for communion, we need to reflect on that and, and come before the Lord and praise and thanksgiving for what Jesus has done. And remember, he's our King of King and Lord of Lords. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, again, thank, thank you seems so far short of the thankfulness that we have for what you have done. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for reconciling us. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that we never walk alone, that we can walk with you in all things. And thank you for the life you've given each one of us. Help us prepare our hearts for communion, Lord. If there's anything in us that uh, needs to be reconciled, I pray that you bring that to our minds and that uh, you just give us new revelation of how incredible this gift is. I pray this in your precious name. Let's stand together. Away my soul surrender. Away my soul to sing. No more empty hallelujah. Let it be real, God, I'm ready. Come to the Father, 
nothing to offer but my sin. You see it all. You see it all. I come to the altar. I come to the end of my own way. I want to know you. I just want to know you. Awake my soul. Surrender. Awake my soul to sing. No more empty hallelujah. Let it be real, God, I'm ready. I come to the Father, all my inhibitions at your feet. I come like a child, I come like a child. Come to the altar, my life's a sacrifice of praise, rising up, rising up to bless your name, awake my soul, surrender, awake my soul to sing, no more air. Hallelujah. Let it be real. God, I'm ready. Let it be real. God, I'm ready. Whatever I feel, hold me steady. Yes, Lord. I will not fear. For you are with me. Let it be real, God, I'm ready. Oh, let it be real, God, I'm ready. Whatever I feel, hold me steady. I will not fear, for you are with me. Let it be real, let it be real, let it be real. Awake my soul, surrender. Awake my soul to sing. No more Hallelujah. Let it be real. God, I'm ready. Let it be real. God, I'm ready. Let it be real. God, I'm ready. Come, Holy Spirit, move in power. Ignite my heart with your holy fire. Show me the Father, show me the Son. Revive my soul again, O oh, Spirit, come. that together again. Come Holy Spirit, move in power. Ignite my heart with your holy fire. Show me the Father, show me the Son. Revive my soul again, oh 
spirit come and all my hope is found in the hands of Christ my King so may my life be found in the hands of Christ my Come, Holy Spirit, fill me up till I am carried by your rising flood. Show me the Father, show me the Son. Revive my soul again, O Spirit, come. And all my hope is found in the hands of Christ, my King. So may my life be found in the hands of Christ, my King. So all my hope is found in the hands of Christ, my King. So may my life be found in the hands of Christ, my King. If you're not here, wanna be I won't be moved unless you move I want you more than the air I breathe I need you I need you if you're not here I don't wanna be I won't be moved unless you move I want you more than the air I breathe I need you I need you if you're not here I don't wanna be I won't be moved unless you move. I want you more than the air I breathe. I need you. I need you. the depths I cry to you in darkest places I will call incline your ear to me anew and hear my cry for mercy Lord ooh, ooh. for you to count my sinful how could I come before your throne? Yet full forgiveness meets my days. I stand redeemed by grace alone. I 
will wait for you. I will wait for you on your word. I will rely. I will wait for you. Surely wait for you till my soul. your hope in God alone. Take courage in this. Jesus from the grave. I will wait for you. I will wait for you. Himself has paid the price that all who trust in Him today find healing in His sacrifice. That all who trust in Him today find healing in His sacrifice. I will wait for you. I will wait for you. Through the storm and through the night, I will wait for you, surely wait for you, on your word, you side of life. I will wait for you, I will wait for you, through the storm and through the night, I will wait for you, surely for you, for your will is my divine. Oh, ooh. in Jesus' name, everybody said. Kids are free to go to kids' class. Adults, you may have a seat. You know, the power of uh, the faith of a child is huge. You know, sometimes I wonder if we're making a mistake by asking probably the greatest teachers to leave the auditorium. <laughs> and we're stuck with us. And, uh, but um, I will tell you, as parents, we'll get into the parent series uh, in about four weeks or so, and we'll walk through that parenting information. But um, I'll tell you what, uh, these children are uh, definitely a gift. And, uh, you know, we, we here at Family Life Christian Church want to make sure that our children are a blessing, not a burden. Uh, they're never a burden. So, well, you know, we're going to begin this series today on marriage. And uh, uh, we talked about uh, uh, this for some time, but my, I've entitled the sermon series Reality Marriage, <laughs> Living in the Biblical Reality of Marriage. Sometimes we have uh, these expectations of marriage that uh, are never lived up to. Have you guys figured that out yet? And um, if you haven't, you will. And, um, uh, but, uh, but I just want to kind of start off kind of a little bit for some of you that don't know who I am uh, as far as my past and whatnot. Um, I grew up in a, in a divorced home uh, six different times with my mom and dad. They were divorced eight times between them. And so I got to see how marriages do not work. I got to see that if it gets too tough, uh, find somebody else. And, uh, and I, I remember my mom telling me years ago before she became a Christian, my mom actually had five uh, marriages. And uh, she, I can, she can relate to the lady at the well in, in John 4. And, uh, but she said, you know, um, I just wanted someone to love me. I just all I ever wanted, just somebody to love me. So at a young age, because her family blew up when she was nine, uh, and, and they all went to foster homes. And, um, and so she thought the answer to her whole 
in her heart was a man. And uh, so she, at a young age, got married. And um, some of you may not know this story, but uh, uh, he took her at a young age, I think probably 15, uh, to the eastern part of the United States, and he tried to sell her into prostitution. And uh, so she called her uncle Jake, and he sent the money uh, for a bus ticket and says, get out of there. And, and then she met my dad, and uh, she thought, okay, but my dad was 11 years older than my mother. And, uh, but it wasn't soon after their marriage that she felt like she married her dad, you know. And, uh, and she thought, well, you know what, I don't want a guy who abuses me, and, I, and now I don't want a guy who, uh, who treats me like a daughter, you know. And uh, so she married another guy named Dale. But Dale was a, a drunk and a womanizer and um, had an affair on my mom. And, uh, and so she thought, okay, I don't want uh, somebody who abuses me. I don't want somebody who treats me like a daughter or acts like a dad. I don't want somebody who's a womanizer and a drunk. So she married my stepdad, Kenny, who wasn't all of those except the fact that he was a drunk. But he was a happy drunk. He loved to tell stories and jokes. And he had false teeth ever since he was in eighth grade. He would pull those out and do a little skip for all of us, you know, and uh, until it freaked me out, and I'm thinking, holy cow, you know, and then he never did it again, uh, but Kenny, fortunately, you know, they divorced, and I stayed connected with Kenny, uh, he taught me a lot of things, that was in my formable years of probably 14 on up, and I ended up leading the, Kenny to the Lord, and uh, baptized him in California, he lived at our house for the last six months of his life, and, um, and then my mom married my Uncle Rick, was that odd or what? I was in the military, and they said, so your mom, her name, I said, Margaret Mack, oh, yeah, I married your dad. I said, nope, my uncle. And they went, I don't want to know. I said, I don't want to tell you. And, uh, but I will tell you the story. My mom would, here's the story. My mom had a, a relationship with my Uncle Rick when she was younger, when my dad was gone all the time. And, uh, and he was just a young man at the time, and so she thought that that was the ideal marriage, or relationship, rather. So for all those four marriages after that, she dreamed to go back to that moment where this guy was kind to her and it was there, he helped out. And when the day came, it just wasn't what um, she thought. It was actually the opposite of what she thought. Uh, there, was, there was a different kind of abuse there. And that's when my mom met the Lord Jesus Christ. And she said, now for the first time in my life, I found what I was looking for. And, um, and, and so with that, that's kind of the background. So when it comes to marriage, um, I have a lot of different marriages in my head, okay? And you ask my wife, who grew up in a home where there was no divorce, so she didn't have any of that DNA in her system. So uh, within the first few months after getting in an argument with my wife, I threw the D word out. Until she finally called me on it. She says, if you're going to keep saying you're going to divorce me, then the courtroom, the courthouse is just right down there, Frank. Get her done or shut up. <laughs> and I'm thinking, wait, what, what, you're, not, you're not supposed to say those things. I'm supposed to use that as a weapon against you. And, of course, that was a horrible thing. But I didn't know any better. Maybe you kind of resonate with my life a little bit. Gosh, what's a good marriage to look like? I don't know. But later on, later on, I began, my mom became a Christian, never to be married again. She says, I found my love, and I have no desire to be married. And so um, she stayed single until the day the Lord took her home. But my dad, on the other hand, uh, he found the Lord, and he actually got married uh, 16 days before Pam and I got married. So every time, every year, he'd always say, happy 10th anniversary, Frank, we're doing it together. And I went, that is weird, Dad. That is very weird. You know, but you know, the cool part is that my dad became a Christian, LaDonna became a Christian, I was able to baptize them in the Lord, and, uh, and they um, have now, with us, celebrated our 32nd year of marriage. And, uh, and God is a faithful God, but it's not always been easy. Some of the greatest memories of our life is in the context of our marriage, and some of the worst memories in our life are in the context of marriage. And so with that, um, uh, I, I want to kind of start off, we're gonna, Brad and I are going to be talking through this for the next four weeks, and uh, man, I hope, now God can do anything He wants, but as of right now, um, our care group is just finishing up uh, some of the information that I'm going to be sharing with you that I think is just fabulous. 
I think it's some of the best stuff I've ever, ever, ever heard in its approach towards marriage. Um, and so, gosh, I encourage you to have a prayerful heart to receive this. If you can get some of this today and some of this stuff in the next several weeks, I'm telling you, it's going to radically transform your life. And you don't have to be married to apply this stuff because it's about the human condition. And so with that, uh, gosh, take some notes. Uh, don't check, your, uh, um, uh, check out because you're not married or whatnot. Oh, this will apply to you because the truth is, uh, we're going to talk in here, what is the source of all of our controversies, of all of our issues. So, so we're going to dive in. If you have a Bible, definitely uh, pull that out. you got your app. Also, it's going to be in your outline. And so here's what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some marriage foundational realities because here's the deal. When you have conflict, it's because your expectations are above what's real. What's real. I had a, oh, uh, a retired pastor tell us a bunch of church planners years ago, your number one goal in life is to teach your people to determine what reality is. Because they're living in a, you see, if they're having conflict, they have an expectation that's up here and reality's down here and they have a huge gap and they are in conflict with one another. You need to help them to lower their expectations to reality. I mean, if my wife, met, when she met me, uh, part of her expectation is possibly was to have this white picket fence, this, just this, you know, this amazing uh, uh, marriage. Well, what she did know about me, she knew I come from a very broken home with a very distorted view of what a marriage looks like. Because I had not the tools to have a happy, godly marriage. I just didn't at the time. And so what I did is when I got to my roadblocks in the marriage, I wanted to quit. I just wanted to give up. I wanted just to say, you know what, this is too hard. You know, the grass is greener on the other side, which is simply a lie. Simply a lie. And uh, so with that, we have to determine the reality. So I want to kind of talk through a few things. I want you to process these things. We're going to walk through some uh, biblical scripture today. Um, But here's what I want, and I'm going to explain some of these things with you. First of all, the character of your life or your marriage is forged in the thousand little steps of faith of God's grace, not the big moments of life, which here's what I mean by that. When my mom passed away, prior to that, God taught me a great lesson. Uh, when we found out she had stage four cancer and uh, we had no clue this was going to happen, because um, I've always wondered in my life, what would I be like after my mom passes? Because I love my mom so dearly. She was my spiritual warrior. Her favorite verse of Philippians 4.13, Frank, remember this, you can do all things through Christ that gives you strength. It's on her tombstone. But I remember when we got the news and I was just with me and God, I I realized that my faith was a lot stronger than I ever thought it would be after getting news like this. And I thought about that. I thought, am I going to fall apart? And I believe without a shadow of a doubt, it was the years and years and years of these little moments in life that I trusted God for that moment. And I didn't always trust Him for the little moments that prepared me for the bigger moment. Just like your marriage. God's not, you're not going to have a lot of big moments in your world. Whether it's somebody passing or whether it's, you know, a big job change. But your life's going to be riddled with a thousand little moments of opportunities. And so what God says, I'm more interested in what you do in those little moments than what happens in those big moments. Does that make sense? Because you're going to spend more of your life in those little moments, same with your marriage. And God's interested in that. And to know that God is in those moments is very powerful. To know that when God was going, I was going through some things in my life, that God was in those little moments, I'm thinking, you care about me that much? I was talking this morning with somebody about the fact that when I was 17 years old, became a Christian, I was eating at my mom's house. She loves making me this bacon mustard sandwich with butter on the bread. Have you guys had that yet? Oh, don't knock it until you try it. Remember, bacon, if anything with bacon, it's good. So I'm sitting there, and I'm so concerned about my mom. I got my brand new Bible, and I'm eating my bacon sandwich she just made, and I said, Mom... And she's smoking a cigarette. She was a chain smoker. And I said, you need to stop those cigarettes. They're going to kill you. And if they kill you, you're going to go straight to hell. I mean, my sandwich goes, what, what are you talking about? I said, you know, Mom, here's the deal. Uh, those cigarettes aren't good for your heart and lungs. You know, and uh, so therefore you, uh, you, you, need to, you need to stop smoking. Otherwise, you know, because you, your body's a temple of the Lord. You don't destroy your temple. I was eating my sandwich. And she says, you know, you enjoying that sandwich? 
I said, yeah. She goes, that bacon's not good for your heart either. She goes, by the way, where are you getting this stuff from? I said, my new Bible. She says, does it have red letters in it? I said, well, hold on a second. Yes, it does. She goes, well, good. I'll never read out of a Bible that doesn't have red letters in it. And, uh, of course, that's the words of Christ. And, but here's the cool part. Not only was God in that moment talking to me about some things, but just before my first child was born, um, I'm sitting there scared to death. In about a month, I'm going to be a father, and I have no clue to, how to be a father. And I cry out to God, how do I be a father? And, and I remember a shop chief says, you know what? If you struggle in reading, which I did struggle, and I still struggle with reading, he says, is go to something you enjoy, then transfer to the Scriptures. So I remember sitting there looking at a hunting magazine, reading it, and then all of a sudden it dawned on me, and I know it was the Holy Spirit saying, if I'm going to bless you with reading, why don't you start with my word? And I'm thinking, isn't this intimidating? Where do I start? You know what God did on that day? He says, why don't you start in the red letters? He reminded me of that moment at that table at 17, and that conversation that he used that moment where I was so unhoned as a Christian to say, once you start in the red letters, you'll find your answer. And of course, the red letters, God says, I want to be your example of a good father. You see, God takes those little moments. Also, marriage is, is hard for everyone everywhere. Can I get an amen? amen? Oh, it's hard for everyone everywhere. If you hear anybody says it wasn't hard for us, kick them. <laughs> get them back into reality. Paul says, marriage is difficult for everybody. It comes with many problems. Now, does it, stay, does it have to stay there? No, we'll talk about that. But I guarantee you, when you started taking two broken lives and bringing them together, that you didn't have a marital bliss all the time. Matter of fact, you had chaos. You know that whole phrase, you know, well, opposites attract, right? Yeah. And then when you get married, then opposites attack. <laughs> yeah, you get that one. All right. Uh, here's another one. Um, as we've all been disappointed. Now, the gospel, the good news, only works if you accept the bad news. It is never good news unless you understand the bad news, and we're going to be talking about the bad news uh, because you need to hear the bad news. You will never receive the gospel as good news until you understand why it's called good news. You have to accept the bad news. Uh, the next one, dating, in most cases, an illusion of the real person. We talked about this in our care group. I mean, have you ever... <laughs> Uh, dated somebody, and man, you couldn't wait to get up in the morning to go see them. I mean, I mean, you dressed. I mean, you were looking in the mirror. You, you primping. I mean, you were like, yes, you were buying gifts. You were doing everything that you normally wouldn't do, right? And the person's going, you are the best. Man, I finally found my soulmate. And by the way, can you, you could just do something about this soulmate thing? There's no such thing. All it takes is one person to mess it up for everybody else. Okay, the truth is, is that we're broken people, and we live in a broken world, all right? And so the bottom line is, is that we have taken this idea that this person that we're dating is the person we're going to marry. Have you been deceived yet? Because the bottom line is, is, after you get married, you wake up and you go, did I marry that? Isn't that true? It's like, this is not how she presented herself, or he presented himself when we were dating, I remember one time talking to my girlfriend, Pam at the time, who's now my beautiful bride, and uh, I remember, because I was in the realm of selfishness, we'll talk more about that, and, uh, I, but my last girlfriend, uh, she didn't like me spending time with my mom. I'm thinking, well, my mom's been out of my life for 10 years, you know, I need to be with my mama, because I'm a mama's boy. Anybody else a mama's boy? Yep, oh yeah. And so, and I said, I love to hunt. And I remember when we first in our dating thing, she goes, what person would ever deny the boy to be with her mom? I said, I like this girl. And what person would ever deny you doing what you enjoy doing? I said, I love her. I'm going to marry her. So, but she, what she didn't know was that I had three and a half days on. I worked at an underground copper mine, three and a half days off. So when I got off, I went hunt for three and a half days. And I spent the other time if I had any free time with my mom. And she goes, whoa. And I said, what do you mean, whoa? 
And, and so, so with that, expectations, I was in the realm of complete selfishness, thinking I have somebody that when I need her, she's there, and I don't have to spend time with her. But you know, what happens is, is that dating, it's like, what happened to the guy or the gal that I dated? Well, that person was a fake. The person you're living with now is the real person, right? And we had to begin to work on our process of uh, relationship at that moment. Now, also, number one, another foundation is we, uh, we make mistake attraction for love. Attraction is not love. Love at, yeah, it's not first sight. Guys, that is not how it works. Like, Cupid just shot me in the heart. That is not how it works. It's attraction. And see, the problem with attraction, I mean, I've done many, many, many weddings. And I sit down with them in kind of marriage counseling and say, hey, uh, uh, why, did you, why did you pick this person? Not Almost 100%, but 99.9% they say, oh, <laughs> He makes me laugh. He is so handsome. He's such a hard worker. She's so beautiful. She's so kind. Okay, so it's all about you. Oh, yeah. What happens if they stop being handsome? Stop being kind? And they're going, well, I hope that doesn't happen. Well, welcome to marriage reality. <laughs> That's going to change. See, I've never had somebody say to me, you know why I married her or married him? is because I believe I, with the gifts that God has given me, could fill the gaps that she or he may have. I feel like I could be a servant to them. I've not heard that. You know, the great Rocky Balboa said, you know, by Paul, he said, why did you marry my sister? She's a bum. He goes, I don't know, Polly. I guess I see it this way. She has gaps, and I have gaps, and together we fill each other's gaps. <laughs> kind of a good way to put it, Right? That's the great theologian, Rocky Balboa. <laughs> but we don't hear that. I'm here to fill their gaps instead of them filling my gaps. All right, here's another one. We take our cues from the world's definition of marriage instead of the biblical definition of marriage. Gosh, do not take your biblical definition of marriage from Hollywood. Oh, how discouraging is that? Right? So we make that mistake. Now also... The whole Bible is our source for a healthy marriage, not just the marriage passages. Out of a book that through the Gospels of Jesus Christ, it has all the topics that he spoke of in alphabetical order, by, range by topic, there's nine chapters. We as humans sometimes desire that. We would like God to put his word in, in kind of a topical format. Have you ever wanted that? If you want to learn about finances, you just go to the finance passages. You want to learn about marriage, go to the marriage passages. You want to learn about anger, go to the anger. I mean, you think, well, that's the only place where you will find help there. That is not true. God's word is sufficient for you in every passage. We don't just go to the marriage. You're limited on that. You're limited. Okay, okay, we got uh, Ephesians 5, love your wife as Christ loved the church, sacrifice for a treater without wrinkle, wrinkle, blemish, or stain, or wives, submit to your husbands unto the Lord and uh, respect them. And then you got, you know, in uh, uh, Hebrews 13, keep your marriage bed pure. So you got that. You got a couple of other places. You're going, well, that's what I have. It's way more than that. And we're going to talk during this series way more than just those biblical passages of Scripture. It's the whole Bible. Um, also, we give too much power to romance. It will not remove the baggage you brought into the marriage. See, we think, and here, what's coming up on the, uh, this month? Some, yeah, yeah, some of you guys are going, he's right. It's coming up like next week from tomorrow. But let, can, can, can I just be kind of a... What a lot of us think of God as a cosmic killjoy. We have let the world to determine what our romance is. That on February 14th, you will have this one and only time to show your loved one with a bunch of hearts and candy and flowers how much you truly love them. But if you mess up, oh, the opposite message will occur. Folks, don't buy into that. When should you love your wife, men? Every day. Do not buy into the lie that it's a few times a year. That's the world trying to do it in their own strength because they're guilty. 
They don't, they don't have the strength to do it every day. But in Christ, you have the strength to love your wife every single day and love your husband and, and to serve them and to take care of them. Don't get caught into these man-made rules. He says, you sound like Scrooge. <laughs> There's something to that. It's like, no. I See, the Resurrection Sunday is not on Easter. It's every day. Every day we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're reminded of that. Don't let it be relegated down to just a single day that humans have created. Does that make sense? Okay, be careful with that. Um, Also, true romance, and this is uh, from Dr. Paul Tripp. He says, true romance is not the cause of a good marriage. True romance is the result of a good marriage. Does that make sense? Your romantic life in your marriage is not the cause of your good marriage. You say, oh, we date all the time. We, we remember each other. We, we get ourselves gifts. That is not the pathway to a good marriage. If romance was your cause of a good marriage, then Christ didn't need to come, right? But see, when you are loving each other and serving one another and being there for one another, then out of that, true romance can come. Does that make sense? Gosh, we can't change anybody. We can't change anybody. If we could change the behavior of anybody, then Jesus didn't have to come. We're going to talk about that with our parenting as well. You can't change the behavior of your kids. If you could, then why did Jesus come? He's the one that takes the heart of stone and turns it into a heart of flesh. You don't do that. Now, you could be part of that, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. All right, so here we are. We're going to walk through three worlds. Uh, we encourage you to understand these three worlds. Your marriage lives in one of three of these worlds. And, uh, and I tell you what, this, some of this information that we talked about in our care group uh, is good stuff. And I'm telling you, I've not come across any better understanding of this stuff. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to walk through some biblical passages. You need to know, you need to know why your marriage is where it's at. Why relationships are where they're at. First of all, the Genesis 2 paradise. We read Genesis 2. We read about, oh, Adam and Eve, right? I mean, we read about the fact that when they, they, they got together and when there was never a fight, they never got upset at each other in Genesis chapter 2. I mean, she dreamed all night about Adam and he dreamed all night about Eve, right? And he wakes up just like, oh, you're so awesome. She goes, you too, how can I serve you today? I was thinking the same thing. How can I serve you today? Oh, let's go do it together. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you don't live there. Let's read it. Genesis 2. Now, bear with me. It's long, but I need you to see the story, okay? Here we go. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day of the Lord, made, God made the earth and the heavens. Verse 5. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field yet, yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And mist was going up from the land, and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there were he put man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made the spring uh, made to spring up every tree that is pleasant in the sight of good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the, the Pishon. Uh, it was one of the, that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there was gold. And the gold of the land is good. Bedellum, which is like this sweet-smelling resin, um, and onyx stones are there. The name of the second river was Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. Cush. And the name of the third river was the Tigris, which flows east of the Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. The bottom line, people say, why would God put that tree there? Because he loved a man's a choice. We at Family Life Christian Church believe in free will, just so you guys know. We do not believe in predestination. <laughs> we believe God gives us the ability to choose Him. 
So he puts that tree there to say, to love me is to obey my commands, and my commands are not burdensome. You get the whole garden and the whole world, and you get the tree of life that you can eat from it forever, but to prove that you love me, you must stay away from this one command of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So that's why that tree was put there. And um, where are we at? Okay. Gosh, that was... Okay, we're going to get there. Okay, he's now out of the ground. Okay, here we go. He says, but the tree of knowledge you can eat, you shall not eat of it in the day, you shall surely die. Verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be what? You know that's true. Being alone is a horrible place. I've asked my mom over the years, you know, because she didn't get remarried. I said, um, um, how's that been, mom? She goes, you know, there's times I get lonely. You know, but she felt God comforted her through that time, but loneliness is is really difficult. It's not good for anybody to be alone. And uh, I will make a, him a helper fit for him. And now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its names. You guys have to understand that Adam was a very brilliant person. Who would have thought of the name orangutan? We'll call that an orangutan. We'll call that a hippopotamus. We'll call, I mean, whatever name he used. Very, very brilliant, okay? And keep in mind, he says God will create a helper for him. Do you know that there's only three other uh, um, titles listed as helper for man? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and woman. What a place to be that you have that kind of influence in the life of your husband. It's huge. There's no one with more influence on the planet than you. So that, that's a huge thing. And, and whatever the man called them, every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not a, found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up in its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. They shall be she shall be called woman. You know, you ready for this? I know I probably shouldn't say this, but it's not online yet. When she was created, she had no clothing because there was no shame, right? So when Adam wakes up and sees her, he goes, Here's how she got her name. He went, whoa, man. <laughs> People said, that's not true. I don't know, but I like it. I like it. Whoa, man, she's awesome. And uh, so with that, and uh, he says, then the man said, okay, called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. They were not ashamed. It isn't amazing. You'll know the after effects of that. So here's what I want you to tell you. Your marital problems is not marriage itself. It was beautiful in Genesis 2. Your problem was never marriage, the institution that God created. All right? So you need to understand that. But here's the deal. There's another world that we, our marriages live in, and that is to the Genesis 3, the fallen world. Um, in your church Bible, it's just page 2. But listen to this another story. See, we sometimes want to go live back into the Genesis 2 world with our marriage and wonder why we can't get there. And we're, gonna, we're not going to leave you in these two worlds. We're going to go into another world. But, but you, you wonder why. Why can't I be like that? Why can't I be like Adam or Eve? It's not possible without the third world that we described today. But here's the second world. This is the world that most marriages live in. Now the serpent was more crafty than the other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, would you circle that? Did God actually say, I'm going to tell you that that is his still number one deceptive tool is to get you to deny the word of God. Get you to deny the word of God. We go through the Word of God, and when something's so crystal clear in the Word of God, we hear this voice that say, did God actually say? And I'll give you one quick example of it, it is in Genesis 1, since we're in Genesis, it says, how, how did God create the heavens and the earth? 
It says, on the first day, he did this. There was morning and there was evening on the first day. On the second day, he did this. And there was morning and there was evening on the second day, all the way to the seventh day. You go to the Hebrew lexicon, a dictionary, uh, and you look up the word day, and it uses Genesis 1 as an example where a 24-hour period is done. So when you read the beginning of the Bible, you will see the word day being associated with a morning and an evening and a number, which always indicates a 24-hour period. Could day mean a spirit period of time or back in Noah's day? Yes. But what happens is that he, the enemy, has done the same thing he did to Eve and said, God didn't actually, did he actually say it was a day? It was really millions and millions of years. Do you know how people in the majority of Christianity get to that millions of years? They have to go to science because of the dinosaurs. Well, obviously God wasn't true in what he said because we got this carbon-14 dating and other forms of dating that says that these animals were millions of years. So therefore, God didn't really mean that. Do you see the trouble with that? You start the beginning of the Word of God with God didn't really say that. Oh, that's just a side note, but he's still doing that today. We're going outside of the Scriptures, taking science and other forms of so-called truth, and we're going back into the Word of God and saying God didn't really mean that. We've got to be careful with that. See, you should not eat of any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the servant, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither you shall touch it. She now is being uh, seduced by him uh, uh, in this battle of words, and she added something to the word of God. He didn't say anything about touching it. She added to that. You could see it start to take place before your very eyes, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Isn't that something? We argue with the enemy that God was wrong. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to her eyes and that the tree was to be desired uh, to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. He wasn't somewhere else. He was right there watching her be deceived by the enemy of God. And he, instead of taking a stick and knocking the serpent out of the tree and grabbing her arm and gently taking her away from the tree, he sat there and watched her be deceived. That's where his sin began. Okay? Then his eyes were, uh, uh, then the eyes of both were open and they knew that they were naked. Shame entered the world, fear entered the world, and selfish into the world, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, a God, uh, God, among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? See, God is doing the same thing. We've been running and hiding from God for a long time. And he's chronically coming after us saying, where are you? Where are you? Instead of being responsible, listen what he says. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, yeah, this, whoa, man. Listen what happened. The man, the woman you had gave me with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate it. Threw her right under the bus. You thought she was the best thing since sliced bread. Now, I don't know if there was sliced bread back then. But it's like, she is the best of the best. She's the only suitable helper. I love her, love her, love her, love her, love her. She's the problem. Right? The blame game began. Okay. Um, verse 13, then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? The woman said, oh, I'm not taking responsibility. The serpent deceived me. You are the blame, God, because you put this snake in the garden. Folks, every time you blame somebody else for your actions, you are carrying out the, the fall of Genesis 3. Always blaming somebody else instead of taking responsibility. Now, he had, and the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and have uh, above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and on the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity 
uh, between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, which is something you can recover from, but you shall, uh, I mean, uh, not can recover from, and you shall bruise his heel. Basically talking about in, this, in the future, there will be a boy baby born from the seed of woman, and King James speaks of the seed. Women don't have seed. It's in a virgin birth. He will crush your head, but you will bruise his heel. So he knew, Satan knew that a boy baby in the future that honors God will give a death blow to him. Not knowing it was Jesus, he first thought it was Abel. Cain was the very first child born, and real quickly he knew that Cain had this heart of wickedness. So it must have been Abel that was going to crush his head, so he has Cain kill Abel. But it wasn't Jesus. All throughout the Old Testament, there's this eternal struggle that takes place. Satan's going after every righteous boy to kill him, thinking that he will be the one to give him a death blow until Christ shows up. And it's like, this is the one. And of course, he tried to kill Jesus as a baby. He tried to kill him when he was to throw him off the cliff. It wouldn't happen. He says, no, no, you have to hang him on a tree. He says, I'll be lifted up and draw him into myself. So Satan didn't want Jesus on the cross because it was a predicted. And when Jesus gets on the cross, he sits there and stretches out his arms and says, for it is finished. Into your hands I commit my spirit. I have now sacrificed my life for all humanity. I have defeated death, right? So Satan's screaming, no, no, no. So with that, that's what he's talking about. So, that's, so all throughout the Old Testament, Satan's, is it him? Is it him? Is it David? Is it Gideon? Is it Abraham? Who is it? And he tries to kill each one of them until finally Christ shows up. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. Thanks, Eve. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Uh, evidently, there was some pain, but it was kind of like, hey, that was good, but it's increased. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but you shall rule over you. So your husband is no longer a servant to you. He's going to want to dominate you now. And to Adam, he says, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree which I have commanded you, you shall not eat of. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it the days of your life. Work's going to be hard now. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face, and by, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was uh, the mother of all living, and the Lord God made for Adam, for his wife, garments of skin, which means some animal had to die in order to clothe them. So death entered the world. He says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life to eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden and to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and the east of the garden of Eden, and he placed cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. You will no longer be in this relationship with God, in this garden anymore. You see, the, here's what I want you guys to understand. The DNA of sin is selfishness. Everybody born after that moment in Genesis 3 borns with this sin nature of selfishness. We have this disease that takes place. That's why you don't have to teach a child to be selfish. You look at them when they're little. Your goal is to teach them to be unselfish. That's your parenting, and we'll talk about that. So here's the deal. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might, what? No longer live for who? themselves, but for him who, for their sake, died and was raised. You see, the goal of any relationship with God, with self, and with other is stop living for yourself. It doesn't work, and it never works. And what we do is we put more law on us to try to get it to work. So get this. Your biggest problem in your marriage is not your marriage or your spouse. The biggest problem in your marriage is you. Folks, I don't know how you take that. That is probably the least thing you would ever want to hear about how to get unstuck in your marriage. That you are the problem. 
and see, but, but it's true. Broken people living in a broken world, what did you expect? What'd you expect? This Hollywood marriage that they conjure up and never does happen? How in the world would you ever expect a good marriage when you have that as the basis of your foundation? Brokenness, brokenness in a broken world. The truth is, we should be shocked that anything works. Okay? So if you can humble yourself enough to say that really it's always been me. See, Jesus Christ didn't come to rescue you from, from the devil or from your spouse or anybody else for that matter. He came to rescue you from yourself. You are your worst own enemy. Do you know that you talk to yourself more than you talk to anybody else? Anybody disagree with that? You're stuck up here all the time of how bad you are, how many mistakes you've made. You're never good enough. You're never smart enough. You're never pretty enough. You're never handsome enough. You're never rich enough. You're never whatever enough. You're chronically talking to yourself. So you are the problem. Do you feel encouraged by an encourager? But you know what? If you could understand that, do you know that people come to me, people come to focus on the family, Minerva and Meyer counseling clinics, and you go anywhere else, that only 10% of the people who seek counsel actually believe it's them. 90% of the people who all seek counsel says, my problem is not me, it's them. I'm just here at this counseling session so you can fix her. If she would just do what I told her. Or if he would just do what I think's right, then it would be better. Because my kingdom is being rocked by his behavior. Or my kingdom is being rocked by her behavior. But if you can be one of the few that says, it's not her, it's not him, it's me. Change this heart. And things will begin to change. That's where it starts. And so we're going to talk about that. So praise God that we aren't stuck there. Oh, gosh. We're going to go through this, but here we go. Number three, 2 Peter 1, uh, 3 through uh, 10. Uh, this is the third world you need to live in, the kingdom of God in Christ. It says here in verse 3, as the worship team comes forward, I'm going to make myself go a little bit faster. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Life and godliness. Be more like Christ through the knowledge of Him, God, Christ, who has called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them, the promises of God that He gives you through Jesus, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of the sinful desire. Me, 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 right? For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfast, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours, that's what he gives us, are yours, and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective whether in your marriage, your personal life, or what, are unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he is, was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, what? You will never fall. Isn't that awesome? What a promise. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance in the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here's what he's saying. When you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and you bowed the knee to him and said, I can't do it in my own strength. I am a sinner. I'm broken. I need somebody who's not broken to help heal me. And when you did that, all of a sudden he says, I've given you everything. I've given you the kingdom of God. You need nothing anymore. You don't need anything else. But we forget that, and we think that our unhappiness in our marriage or in our life is because something or somebody is not doing it. So we go after humans 
or things to try to find joy, peace, patience. It's not found there. It will never be. If it could be found there, Jesus would have never have to come. What he brought us is this kingdom mindset, a new place to live that you will say, you mean to tell me I have it all? You have it all. But what happens if my spouse doesn't do what they're supposed to do? You still have it all. But what happens if they do what they're supposed to do? Oh, you'll have even more. You will celebrate together. Here we are. God has already given us all we need in Christ. Now, there's three mindsets that shape your marriage. Let's walk these quickly. You look at these scriptures on your own. The reaping mindset, what seeds you're planting in your garden of your marriage. Here's the bottom line. When we learn this in our care group, it's pretty phenomenal. Whatever you're reaping right now in your marriage, you planted the seeds some time ago. You're harping your own, uh, you're reaping your own harvest. You mean I did that? Yeah. When you were not loving your wife or respecting your husband, what did you expect to happen? What kind of harvest did you expect? Plant the good seeds. Number two, value mindset. Where is your treasure? What's important to you? What's important to you? I will tell you, men, you want to give your wife the greatest gift on Valentine's Day is let her know where she fits in the pecking order of your schedule. Let her know that she's right under God. Right under God. That I will neglect the other things without neglecting you, but God must come first, your second, children third, the church fourth, and the world fifth. That's a gift. Number, number three, grace mindset. Giving your spouse what they need, not what they deserve. Being part of what God is doing to transform your spouse, not what Satan is doing to tear them down. Here's the thing. I, uh, I have personally have done the work of the enemy in my own marriage, and I'm sorry for that. Throughout our 32 years, there's times I got my feelings hurt and my selfish desire welled up. And I went and I did what the flesh would do is try to fight back. And I've said things that were horrible to her. And, and now, even though I've known this before, but I didn't realize why, I'm just trying to be a nice guy. Why do you have to be angry at me? And then I, instead of loving her like Christ would and give her the grace that she needs, I would say something or do something that would dishonor her and dishonor my Lord. I think we've all done that. And what grace is what's different than the first two worlds is grace was needed for us to accomplish the word of God and to give people what they need, not what they deserve. And when you give your spouse grace and truth and love, you will grow. You will grow. Well, we're going to, I challenge for you today is you need to choose your world. We're going to walk through this bread. In a couple of weeks, it's going to take you to the next step. Uh, next week, again, is our vision potluck. But, uh, but I'd like you to hang in there, invite some people. We're going to give you some resources by the end of this uh, uh, series. And, uh, but I just want you to know that there's hope. There's hope. Praise God. God didn't leave us in Genesis 3, right? That he'd give us another world that we can live in. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for who you are. I thank you for this, your word. Father, I know we've been through a lot today. Father, but I pray that every marriage, every person uh, will leave here encouraged that there is hope. You knew we were all broken. You knew there was no solution just by following a bunch of rules, even righteous rules that you've given us. It's like Paul said, if by living out the law would have set us free, we would have been free by now. But we need your grace through Jesus Christ. We need to realize that you love us so much that you were willing to give us your only son. We didn't deserve Jesus. We needed him. And Father, I pray that today that if there's any person here that has not recognized their need for Jesus Christ, that today they'll say, yes, I can't do this on my own. I can't keep another relationship strong or together. I cannot keep my own life together. I need help. And that's why you gave us your son and you gave us your spirit and your truth. By the Holy Spirit's power, we can overcome our weaknesses, but we cannot do it alone. So Father, be with us now. May we make the decision to make a commitment to realize that our problem is not with anybody else, it's with ourself. That we humble ourselves and we let you transform our heart of stone into a heart of flesh. That we be a glory to you, Father. We thank you so much for being the only one that can change us. 
And may we be part of grace to change the hearts of people around us. Father, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. If you'd like me to pray for your marriage, I'd love to pray with you right over here. If you'd like to pray with each other, pray for your marriages. Let's kick Satan in the teeth, right? And let's uh, live in this realm of godliness that God has for us.
We'll see you next Sunday. 